I'm excited to be in God's house today, amen? Amen. Hey, I'm excited you're here, man. We're in part six of the study of the character and life of David. How many of you enjoyed this series so far? Are you guys loving this? I'm so excited, man, to continue to dive into this. That's why we extended it. We're actually in the part, though, of David's story. If you missed any of it, they're on YouTube and on the website. You got to go check them out. But we're in the part of David's story that's almost hard to look at, right? Here's this man after God's own heart who is so valiant and this this uh, giant killer, this king, this worshiper, and we see him and the mistakes he's made and the consequences of his choices. And it's, and it's a little bit hard to look at, quite honestly, because our own sin and mistakes are hard to look at, aren't they? They're a little bit hard. And we ended last week with this David and Bathsheba occurrence, the season of vulnerability and lack of accountability in David's life that led to his downfall. And we saw Nathan confront David and the consequences of his choice of him committing adultery and killing the woman's husband, Uriah, the pregnancy that resulted out of that adultery, that child was killed, but died. And, and not only that, we saw a judgment that Nathan gave to David. It was almost this prophetic thing where he said, calamity and feud is going to follow your house. Someone in your house is going to bring feud and division because of the choices, this choice that you've made. And that's kind of where we pick up the story. There's a feud that's happening in David's life. But here's one of the, like, one of the reasons I love David, and I hope that through the, the ugliness that we're going to see that, that maybe you can give him a little grace and still love him too, is, is his heart posture in, in it all, like in the consequences. He doesn't stay down in it. Like, let me show you, share with you a scripture. Galatians chapter 6. This is not in your notes, but I want to kind of preface the teaching today. It says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Okay, so this is a New Testament verse talking about sowing and reaping, and this is, this, this will happen. This is, you think that is an Old Testament thing, like, oh yeah, you, you, you get what you give, and sow what you reap, and eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But this is a New Testament teaching telling us that whatever you sow, this is a law of God, a principle that he, has, he governs and has established. If you sow a seed in the natural, you will reap a seed in the natural according to that kind. If you sow a seed in the spiritual, in the emotional, in, in your attitude, whatever it is, you will reap according to that kind. He says God can't be mocked. There's going to be, David, I'm sorry, God can't be mocked. You made a mistake, and you're going to reap from what you've sown. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And here we see David now in this story, some of the consequences of what Nathan was alluding to, the prophet of God was alluding to in his life. But this is why I love David so much, and I hope that you'll love him too, even through his mistakes and issues is that he doesn't stay in his mistake. He doesn't stay in his mess and in his brokenness. He, he repented and didn't repent just because he got caught. Like he was broken because he grieved the heart of God because he actually committed some betrayal act against one of his brothers and mighty men that fought with him, Uriah. Like he was broken before God and he refocused his life upon the Lord. And this is why... I love David so much, and this is why he is a man after God's own heart. Not because he's perfect, not because he never did something wrong, you guys. It's because when he did do something wrong, he didn't stay there. Now, the reason why I want to bring this up is because some of you disqualify yourself from being a man of God, a woman of God, qualified to teach or to serve or to lead or go to church even for whatever. Like, we have these concepts. Some of you are like, why even try? I mean, I'm just going to continue drinking because that's just why I even try. I'm just going to continue doing this and this habit. I'm just going to continue cheating because I'm already a cheater. I'm just going to continue doing this. You're like, you don't even try to live holy anymore because you think that ship has sailed. And that is a lie of the enemy. That is a lie of the enemy. You don't have, and this is what David is teaching us through the mess that we're studying right now. You don't have to stay there. You do not have to stay there. You can repent. You can humble yourself, and you can refocus your life. And sometimes it gets hard with the consequences and mistakes we've made to still stay low, 
Focus on God. Let the consequences come. Yep, I made a mistake, and that's going to happen, but I love you, Jesus, and I'm going to follow you through it. And through this, we see David's posture. We see it. He's in the middle of the consequence still. Like the kid, his child has died, and now we're going to pick up the story where there is division in his house. Like there is a feud happening between Absalom, one of his sons, and between David. So much so that this, there was like a wedge of unforgiveness, and Absalom takes David to war. And this is where we're going to pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 18, you guys. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place. Somebody say battle. There is a battle happening right now, and you need to know that. You need to be aware that there is a battle happening. I think like as we study David, here was kind of like one of my fears is that as we study David and all these giants and Goliaths and stuff like that, that you can disassociate yourself because you don't see a giant. You don't see a Goliath. You don't see Philistines and Amalekites and Hittites, and you don't see these battlefields and swords and spears and, and arrows and stuff like that. And because of that, some of you have erroneously come to the conclusion that you're not in a fight. And there is a battle happening right now. And just because you cannot see the enemy crawling through your windows or beating down your doors does not mean, man of God, your house is under siege. There is a war happening right now, and, and I think a lot of us are not dressed for battle. You know, we see the armor of the Old Testament. You, 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 if you're fighting with swords and spears and arrows and stuff, you put, on, you put on the right armor, but there's a different battle that is happening in today's age. Ephesians chapter 6, not in your notes, but y'all got to study Ephesians 6. talks about the armor of God that we need to put on to stand against the enemy. And it says that he's a schemer, that he's a tactician, that he's a, a strategic enemy that is not going to fight you like we read in the Old Testament in David with the Malachites and Philistines and giants and stuff like that. No, no, no. There's other giants and other enemies that are coming against you, and you need to be dressed for battle. There is a battle happening for your soul, for your purpose, for your family, mom and dad. There is a battle for your family. There is a battle for your identity and your kids' identity. There's so much confusion Happen, right? There's a battle for masculinity in our nation, in our world right now. Confusion is, is rampant. Men trying to be women and women trying to be men. It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual battle that is happening right now. And there's, there's a battle. It says a battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There Israel's troops were routed by David's men. And the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men, so a bunch of, and we're talking about this is war, like, Blunt trauma, okay, swords and, and spears and all kinds. The battle spread all over the whole countryside. And then we got this sentence that stood out to me. And the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Isn't that interesting? The forest swallowed up more men than the sword did that day. What is with this? And I prayed on that and was studying this through different, you know, avenues and and, you know, th this is not like the Lord of the Ring Ents or something like that. These aren't the tree folk. It's not tree beard here, okay? My nerd is coming out. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But anyway, this, is, this ain't that. But I want you to imagine with me the scene that the Bible is painting. It's not, it's like you're walking through and you just see this forest. There's bodies everywhere. Just laying over stumps and roots and sprawled out over here. And there's no sword wound. And there's no spear or no arrow in their, in their back. What, what's happening here? I'll tell you what's happening. Listen, the enemy is pulling men and women out off of the battlefield and getting them to go into the woods of depression, the woods of discouragement, the woods of, of secret sin, the woods of bitterness. The woods represent anything that is not God's plan for your life. That's what the woods represent. And we have a battle to fight and you need to do everything in your power, men and women of God, to win that battle. And you've already been guaranteed victory in Christ. You've been given the armor to fight the battle in Christ. Then we see Absalom, it says, goes into the forest. He goes into the woods. And he meets David's men. He's riding his mule. And as the mule went under the thick branches of the large oak in this forest, Absalom's hair gets caught in the tree. So Absalom is the one who actually, we're told, goes First, the leader of the men went into the woods, and then the people followed him. Don't ever think that your sin doesn't affect your family. Some of you think that because what you do, you do in secret, that it's not going to affect your spouse or your kids. 
But, but that is another lie of the enemy. Um, your kids will follow you into the woods. Your spouse will follow you into the woods. You think like, well, I can handle it. No, I, I'm, I'm, I, can ha- I can handle one drink. Yeah, but he sees you take one and take, takes ten. I can handle this. Yeah, but the people following you go further into the woods than you went. You said you wanted to go deep. Come on, somebody. Amen? Absalom is hanging there. His head is caught. And, and hanging, uh, here's, here's the point. The devil's not in a hurry to pierce your heart if he's got a hold of your head. Absalom, is, his eyes are wrapped up so he can't see. His ears are wrapped up so he can't hear. His mind is wrapped up. Absalom is just hanging there awaiting his demise, awaiting his eventual death. But what happened? What, what got Absalom? What, what led Absalom to this place? It took place about 10 years prior to this event of Absalom's death. Everything was going great. Everything was going good in David's house, seemingly going good. But as you know, David had many concubines and wives and so many kids from every different woman. There was bound to be division and dysfunction, and it did happen. One day, one of David's kids committed an evil sin against another one of his kids. You can go read the story. It's disgusting and awful. It's actually Absalom's sister that was defiled in a way that, that is terrible. And David didn't know what to do. His kids are fighting, did a terrible thing, and didn't know what to do. Second Samuel chapter 13 actually says what David did. It says when King David heard what had happened, he was very angry. And that's all he did. What, what a picture of the passive dad in our culture today, of the passive parent in our culture today, to where all he did was get mad. He didn't step in. And now here's Absalom sees it and is wondering in himself, like, why didn't dad do anything? Why didn't dad correct him? Why didn't dad defend me? Why didn't dad step in? Why didn't dad bring correction or discipline? Why didn't dad do anything? What was David thinking? Oftentimes we put dads on this pedestal like they're supposed to know what to do in every situation and supposed to get it right every time listen to me, please. There are no perfect fathers. There's only one perfect heavenly father. All of our fathers are going to fail us. Today, I want to talk to you about the father wound. Absalom carried a father wound, a bitterness that drove him mad, so angry, and it caused such a division. But every single one of us, every human, every man and every woman carries with them a a wound from their father. I was reading about this UFC fighter um, his name was, I think, let me see, Jens, Jens Johnny Pulver. The, his nickname was Lil Evil. Five foot seven scrapper, okay? But he started in some small rings, worked his way all the way up to UFC. Some of you probably know UFC fighting, Ultimate Fighting Championship. He, he fought and he won and he's like bloody and, and, and the announcer puts a microphone in front of his face says, you just became the ultimate fighting champion. How do you feel now? And this is a guy who would actually become a Christian later and write an autobiography, but he would tell his story that his dad at seven years old put a gun in his mouth and would threaten him and would tell him like, I would blow your brains out if you were worth the bullet. And he would abuse him physically and emotionally. He had scars all over his backs and his sides from the screwdrivers that were thrown at him and stabbed at him. And he carried this wound with him so his entire life. So when the announcer says, how do you feel? You've become the champion. He's crying, sobbing and bloody. And he says, see, dad, I, I could amount to something. And he would later write that, that with every fight, every time he got into the ring, he was beating his dad. He was punching his dad. He was getting back at his dad, much like many men and women today who carry a wound, a father wound that has not been healed. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know where to take it. And it's affecting our lives far more than many of us even realize. Here is Absalom eaten up by the passivity and the neglect of his, 
of his father. David missed it. Sure, he did. He's not, he's not perfect. We know that. But because he missed it, Absalom grew bitter and angry to where he's like, David is, uh, Absalom is thinking like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Like he hated his father. And there was this anger and, and there was a silent treatment going on. Between father and son, they for years did not exchange any words. No words at all between Absalom and, and, and David. And after many years, it didn't get better. It just got worse. Absalom actually creates a plot and kills his brother that committed this sin against his sister. He kills him, and then he, he flees away. He runs because he killed one of his dad's, the king's sons. He runs, and he flees. And after a few years of living in, like in an exile, just running away, his dad calls him back home. Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 21, pick up the story. It says, so the king sent for Joab, that's one of his generals we've been reading about, and told him, all right, go and bring the young man Absalom. Bring him back to me. But the king gave this order, Absalom may go to his house, but check this out. He must never come into my presence. So Absalom never saw the king. You can't see my face. You can live around me, but you can't see me. You can't know me. I'm not... I'm not going to know you, and you're not going to know me. This father and son, they were living in the same neighborhood, but never associating and seeing what an awkward family moments and glances that, like, and, and by the way, all of Israel is watching this. All of them know. All of Israel know what happened, and they know, they're just wondering, like, how is this novella going to play out? You know what I mean? How's this, like, where are the shows, like, in Spanish, it's novella. What are they called? The soap operas. <laughs> I'm not even Spanish, you guys. I'm just from Bakersfield, you know what I mean? I'm just like, what do they call that again? But they're all watching like, oh my gosh, what is, what is going to happen here? The father wound can happen. Look, even to those of you born in the best of families, there is still room for an unmet expectation that left untreated can become a wound, can become something that affects us and hurts us. Even in the best of homes, there is room in our hearts for a wound from our father. It's affecting so many people. Here's, here's some of the causes of some father wounds. And I'm hoping that looking at some of these causes that maybe some revelation, some light bulbs can begin to happen and some insight to your own life that maybe you're carrying things that maybe you don't even know that you're carrying today. Like it's influencing and causing you to do things, say things, and maybe to treat your wife in ways, your kids in ways, your boss in ways that you didn't even know. Like it was, it actually goes back to this wound. And this hurt. Here are a few causes. Here's the first one. Write it down. The first one is neglect. Just simply where it's just, we, I felt neglected. And this can make us feel like we're unimportant. That's how it shows up in our life, where we feel like I am, I'm just not that important, not that important to him. And therefore, I'm really, I don't think I'm that important to people. Here's the second cause. Absence. Absence, where he just wasn't there. He wasn't, it's not that he like put a gun to my face or anything. I didn't, my dad didn't do that. He just was not there, whether it was a divorce, a separation, or even death. There's a wound through the separation and the silence. How many of you know silence speaks volumes? Volumes it speaks. And so many of us have a wound because he just wasn't there. For others, it's abuse. That he was there and he was abusive. He was abusive verbally to you when when you wanted him to say, good job, he said, I'm disappointed in you. When you wanted a hug, he gave you a hit. Like that kind of father who, who either was uh, mentally, physically, sexually, or spiritually abusive and leaves so many men and women wounded in life or the controlling dad. The controlling dad can cause a, a wound in our in our heart, and our life, where we are, those that they're just so dominating and domineering and dictating and overpowering. And what some of us have lived under the rule and the reign of controlling parents have left some wounds in our heart and our life. Or here's the last one. A parent that was just withholding. Just withholding the love, the affirmation. Like for some of you, you never heard him say, I love you, kid. So you never heard him say that. You never heard the validation and the affirmation of your father. And as a human being, every single one of us were designed, meant to have that connection with our fathers. That was, we were designed that way, to have this validation and affirmation and love 
from our Father. And when we don't get it because of the brokenness of men and the brokenness of our world, it causes a lot of pain. And this is why there's so many people who are Christians, they're saved. Salvation can get you, like it makes you a new creation in Christ, but it doesn't treat the wounds. It doesn't. That's why you can be forgiven and still broken, which so many of us are forgiven, but broken inside. And the effect is this. Here's the effect of a father wound. The effect of a father wound is a low self-esteem. Some of you don't know that's why you think what you think about yourself. It comes back here. It's a low self-esteem, a deep emotional pain inside, and here's the result, a performance orientation where you feel like you have to perform, that you have to earn it. Hey, you got to get the attention and get the affirmation. I got to do what's right, and that makes us human doings rather than human beings. So you're living your life doing, doing, accomplishing, achieving, trying, having measures of success outwardly, but all at the same time feeling like a failure internally. You're a human doing instead of a human being. I was researching some statistics, and there's 24 million children in America right now growing up without a father figure in their life. 24 million. Between first grade and 12th grade, 43% of kids don't have a father figure. Someone who believes in them, another man who believes in them, who says, who's going to say, I love you, who's going to give that little bit of affirmation and validation in their life, in the effect, it's not just a man thing, it affects women as well. And so many of you women that are here today have been affected by a father, have been wounded by your dad. It's, it makes you like, like where you see, man, so many women can't, they have a negative filter, a critical filter on men. He's got anger and aggression. They have so much fear of abandonment and trust issues because of what daddy did to them. So you're cutting people off and you're afraid of people leaving you. So you leave them first. Or, or so many women are attracted to the father wounded boy acting like a man because of what your dad did to you. Absalom is just craving his father's attention and his love in his life, just like every one of us in this room. Again, even those of us who are, those of you who are born in good homes, we're just looking for the I'm proud of you, good job. And we got, maybe you got like, I, I am, I'm disappointed in you. And maybe you, when you wanted a hug, he walked away. He just, he did not do what you needed him to do. Let's address some of the barriers that inhibit healing. Why? So why are we today still affected? We're grown people now. Why are we still affected by what happened to us when so many, some of us 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we're still affected by some of the things someone else has said, someone else did to us. Here are some reasons why we still kill. Uh, barriers to our healing of the father wound. Number one is pride. The pride in our life. And pride says this. Pride says, I'm all right. That's what pride says. Pride says, yeah, I know it was messed up. I know it was like, it was tough and stuff, but I'm okay. I'm all right. And we diminish the reality. We deny the reality of the pain of the wound. And some of you may think like, you know, all the, I was wounded so long ago. What's the use of talking about it? What's the use of bringing it up again? I mean, it was so long. It's a, I don't really think I should even be addressing that. It happened so long ago. You know, time heals all wounds. Baloney. Time does not heal all wounds. That's, that's a lie of the enemy. Time does not heal what you won't face. Come on, amen, somebody. Are y'all with me today, okay? Absalom is waiting years and years, and time did nothing but fester his wound to where he plotted and killed his own half-brother. And that, and his revenge, his vengeance did not even satisfy. That you think like, if I just got back, if someone just, if someone did to them what they did to me, that that would somehow pacify, it wouldn't, it would make it worse. That's not what you need. Revenge is not what you need. Vengeance is not what you need. And that's what we crave for. And that's what Absalom craved for. And it did not satisfy him. He was so prideful. Pride. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 14. It says this about Absalom. Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all of Israel. This is after he moved back uh, into Israel, not seeing his father. He was a handsome dude. They still talk about him like Jewish people still talk about Absalom today. He was so he was flawless from head to toe. This guy was like Fabio, all right, or Justin Bieber. Like, you know what I mean? 
He was the Zoolander of Israel, okay? <laughs> this guy was, he cut his hair only once a year. Check this out. And when he cut his, he, when he cut his hair, it was a national event. Like everybody came out to see, oh, he's cutting his hair today. Everyone logged on. He's going live. He's going live. Absalom's cutting his hair. Look at, look at. And they only, he only did it. He was so heavy. Look what it says. Absalom weighed it. He weighed his haircut. Look at this dude. Can you believe this dude? This dude is so prideful, so arrogant. Five pounds, and no matter what he did, no matter how hard he tried to look good or look the part or do the part, he never could get his daddy's attention. It was never enough. Still, Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two years, but he never got to see the king. He tried and tried, and that's what so many people were doing, trying to do right, trying to look right. If I just, if I can do enough and be enough and work hard enough, then I'll get the I love you. Then I'll get the good job, kid. Then my, my dad will be proud of me. Then uh, maybe I'll, I'll arrive at that place. No, he didn't, and it ate him up. Pride ate him up, and here's the second barrier to our healing of the father wound, and that's deception. Really, deception follows pride very often, where we have this misconception. A lot, of, a lot of people with a father wound, they have a misconception of themselves. They don't see themselves accurately the way we should see ourselves. We don't see our father the way we should see our father, flaws, mistakes, and all, and everything. We don't. We see them through the, through the filter of our pain and our wound. Or even God, there's, there's a deception. We don't see ourselves, our fathers, people. God, we're just not seeing things accurately. We're not seeing it. And when we hold uh, this thought and this concept of our birth father, when we think of them as like angry and alcoholic and critical and negative and mean and abusive and jerk and, and all this stuff that we think about our fathers, usually we will tend to believe something about our self if we see our father that way. So here's, here, your, if your relationship with your father is that way and you think of him that way, you probably think of yourself like this. You probably think you're unworthy. You probably think you're stupid. Like and no matter, you're, and you could be very successful. You're a successful person. And outwardly, people, people like, yeah, you're, wow, look at, look at them. But inwardly, you feel like you're not enough and you didn't do enough. Or in, like you'd be, you could be doing things right, but inwardly you're thinking about what you did wrong, not what you did right. And that's because you have this voice in the back of your head, this wound in the back of your head. But you're stupid, you're dumb, you're unworthy, or you feel incompetent, or unloved, or unlovable. As long as we accept these words as truth, you're going to continue to experience depression, anxiety, anger, frustration. But listen to me, please. The, the reason why the enemy put a wedge between you and your earthly father was not just to destroy that earthly relationship. There was a bigger reason. The reason, the real reason why there was the enemy caused a wedge between you and your father was so that you would not know how to relate to your heavenly father. This is the reason. This is, the, this is why the enemy caused the hurt and the pain and the wound and what you continue to perpetuate because you're not dealing with it. Let me kind of prove it to you with an example. Some of you don't have a problem with saying, I love Jesus. I love you, Jesus. But you have a problem saying, I love you, Father. I or I love you, Daddy. Like that's harder. It may even be for some of you awkward to say, like, I love you, Father God. I love you, Daddy. That's hard for you to say because the wound is affecting that relationship. And some of you like even like stories and movies. You like the movies where the son is the hero and the father's forgotten. And that's why you like Jesus. Oh, he's the hero of the story. I don't know. I can't relate to the father, but I can relate to Jesus really well. Listen, Jesus said that no man comes to the father but through me. Jesus' job is to lead you to the father. See, Jesus' job is to, is the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal the Son to you so you can be forgiven. The Son's job is to lead you to the Father so that you can be healed. So th this is where your healing comes from. And the enemy knows that. That if he can keep you disconnected from your Father God, if you can, like your image of God, many people's image of God and perspective of God is, is 
misconstrued because of their earthly father's relationship. They attribute a lot of the same characteristics of anger and frustration and mad and, and I'm not enough and these kind of things, this achievement-based, religious rule-based kind of stuff. They attribute that to God because of the relationship with their father and the enemy knows this. So here's the relationship to God the Father, if you had an earthly relationship with your father that was twisted that way, then a lot of us, we think of our relationship with God that I'm not good enough. I haven't done enough, which is a reason why a lot of people, your faith and your walk with Christ is up and down and in and out. You're hot and cold. Sometimes you don't even come to church for long spouts of time because you're not living right, and therefore you can't come to church because God's mad at you. I made a mistake, so, so, so I'm not in a good season right now, so you just stay disconnected. Why? Because you think God, because you think you're not good enough. And that's a lie. I'm not good enough. I'm guilty. I'm shameful. I must work harder to justify myself. And if and, okay, if you let this pride and deception creep in, it's not gonna just stay there. It's gonna, it's gonna affect everything. You'll you'll be deceived about how you see yourself, how you see people, how you see God. But you'll even, deception will start just working its way through your life if you have this father wound. You will lie about things that you don't even have to lie about. You'll manipulate situations and people that you didn't even, you just will manipulate facts. You go, why did I do that? Why? It's because you have this wound that's causing you to respond and react in ways that you don't even want to react. It happened to Absalom. It started with this just little anger and frustration, just a little wedge of unforgiveness and all blown out pride and deception is happening in this guy's life. Let's look at it. Second Samuel, the story continues. It says, after this, Absalom bought a chariot and horses and hired 50 bodyguards to run ahead of him. Look at the pride on him. He's like, he's announced every time before he goes somewhere with, ho- with horses and chariots and, and bodyguards. And he got up early every morning and went out to the gate of the city. Check out what he did. When people brought a case to the king, David, for judgment, So they're coming into the city. Absalom wanted to be the first one to talk to him. Absalom would ask, where in Israel are you coming from? And they would tell them his tribe. Then Absalom would say this, you've really got a strong case here, man. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I wish I were the judge. Then everyone can bring their case to me for judgment and I would give you justice. And he's deceiving the people. When people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't even let him bow. Like here he is, the pride of it. Like he's got people announcing him in chariots and bodyguards and all this stuff. But when someone tried to bow, it says Absalom would like take him by the hand and go, no, 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 no. Don't bow before me. I'm not your king. I'm your brother. I'm your friend. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for you. I'm for you. And he kisses them. And Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment. And so he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. Little by little, the deception that was inside of Absalom got into the other, got into everyone else. He started lying and slandering his dad and and, 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 and working his way in heart into deceiving the people, all from a wedge of unforgiveness. Deception creeped into his life. Pride, deception are barriers to our healing. Write this down. The third one is just the wound itself. Just write it down like that. The wound itself. Some of us, it is the barrier. You still feel the the pain or the shame of it, the regret of it. Sometimes you're even triggered by it, by certain things, and and you kind of don't even know why. It's just a barrier, that continuous emotional hurt. Jesus said this in Matthew 13. I'm hoping this is going to happen today. I've been praying for you all week. Breakthrough is coming to this house today in Jesus' name. Jesus said this, for this people's heart, has become calloused. It's become so hard by what we've experienced and the hurt and the pain. They hardly hear with their ears and they've closed their eyes. Kind of like Absalom hanging there. Hanging there in the woods. Not on the battlefield. Not not in God's plan. Not in God's will. Just hanging there. Otherwise you would see with your eyes. You'd hear with your ears. Understand with your hearts. And he says this. Turn and I'll heal you. Today you have an opportunity to turn and allow God to heal the the pain, the wounds, the hurt that have been influencing a lot of your decisions, a lot of your marriage, a lot of your mistakes. You didn't even know, but it comes back to this. So how do we do it, you guys? How do we heal from our father wounds? Number one, write it down. Number one, realization is the first step. Where you just admit 
your wounds, okay? You can't address the problem that you don't know exists. We got to just be like, yes, that hurt. That happened. I'm not all right. It is like, I know it's been a long time, but that still sucks, and that was not okay. You got to come to this realization and admit that there was an unmet expectation. There was a word. There was a pain that happened. Here's what the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 6, 14 to the Israelites. He said, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. And that's how so many of you try to handle your wounds, your past. You just try to act like it ain't there no more. And it is there. And it's pulling the strings. It's pulling the strings on your frustration. It's pulling the strings on your addiction. It's pulling. You look all throughout prisons all over the country. And the common denominator in these prisons and these people is not like, oh, they just like to sin. They're just addicted. They're just, they're just, they're just bad people. The common denominator is the father that wounded them. All over. We got to just realize you can't heal what you hide. Because that wounded girl turned into a wounded woman. That wounded little boy turned into a wounded man. And now you're bleeding on people that never hurt you. You're still, you're still wounded and bleeding. Psalm 109, 22. David said this, for I am afflicted and needy. Here it is, just, just admitting, coming to that, like, I am afflicted. And some of you don't like to, you don't like to be in need. You, you hate being in need. You hate that you have this need to be healed. And you will never experience healing and wholeness if you can't come to this realization. I am afflicted and needy. My heart is wounded within me. I was hurt. Before you can begin to heal you got to acknowledge the ways that you've been wounded. you got to acknowledge it. you got to realize it. You even have to grieve about it. You know, you have to express some grief. It gives you an opportunity to, to grieve over the lost, what you've lost. Some of you have lost time. You've lost relationship. You've lost innocence. You've lost your peace. You've lost your childhood. Don't make the mistake of after coming to realization, maybe a message like this, and you're like, yep, that happened. But here's what a lot of people do. After realization, they choose suppression. You sweep it under the carpet. You act like it's, it's, it's not there, okay? It's like, it's like deleting a bunch of stuff off your computer and it never, never emptying the trash. Never emptying the trash bin. It's still taking up space on your computer. You realize it. You even kind of like shoved it off to the side, but it's still there and it's still taking up space in your life, which is the second step that you have to get to. After realization is transformation, where I now invite Jesus into the wounds. Write down, write down next to wounds, memories. Because what I'm, what I'm talking about here in, in this transformation is you invite Jesus into that memory, into the words, into the wounds that were spoken in the healing process. The wound becomes a scar. You know, the difference between a scar and a wound is a scar is a healed wound. That's what it is. We need to bring our wounds to Jesus, let him heal them, and then he can use our scars for his glory. Some of, our, some of our worst scars can be our best ministry opportunities. Where God can be glorified the most in our life is where we have the grossest scars. Can I tell you something? Lead your life. Lead your family, man of God, women, woman of God. Lead your life from your scars, not your wounds. I, I, I don't want to preach wounded all right, I don't want to, because if I preach wounded, I'm just going to inflict pain on you. I don't want to be a wounded pastor, a wounded preacher, a wounded parent, a wounded spouse, because what wounded me does not have to hold me forever. What wounded me does not have to affect me forever. And this is what I love about Jesus. I love this about Jesus because I do love that Jesus rose from the grave, absolutely. But what I love equally, probably even more, is that he kept the scars. Here, touch my hands and touch my, touch my side. Because Jesus was scarred and he kept his scars. It gives us hope that we too who are carrying wounds can receive the healing of Jesus and lead from our scars. First Peter chapter 2 says this, By his wounds you have been healed. You're not healed because of your strength because of your effort, because of your achievement. This is one of the big challenges of those of us who are dealing with father wounds still, is that we're achievement-based. We try really hard, like we feel like we have to earn it. Can I tell you something? A whole person doesn't have to work from their identity, but for their identity. A whole person works from their identity, not for 
their identity. Some of you are working really hard for it, for it, for it, for it, for it, for it. And you're not working from it, from who you are in Christ. God didn't create you to be achievers. He created you to be receivers. God, God, your identity is not something you achieve. It's something you receive. Your adoption and sonship does, is not something you achieved. It's something you received. Your righteousness in Christ is not something you achieved. It's something you received. Transformation happens when you invite Jesus into the womb, into the memory. Like into that moment where you said, that's what he said, Jesus. Invite him right there, Jesus. That's what he said. That's what he did. That's when it hurt. That's when he hit me. That's when he said it. That's when he left. That's when. That's when. And let Jesus take that moment and redeem it and transform it. Romans chapter 2, verse, or 12, verse 2 says this. Let God transform you into a new person by what? Changing the way you think. I remember having a moment, a season of my life where I was so grieved. My father left when I was a month old. And so I, he was not present. He was not there. And at times when he was there, he was abusive, even when he would come around when I was younger and stopped coming around altogether. And so I had this, I remember, a, it was about two years after I accepted Christ. And, and I was just so broken and, and crying like, why? Why did I not have my dad? Why was he not there? Why was he so mad? Why do you have to leave? Why do you have to start another family? Why does he love them, those kids, and not, not me? Why am I not accepted? Why, why, why? And I'm just so, I was eat up for it until this moment of revelation happened as I was processing my pain with Jesus, asking for his help. Right there in that pain, Jesus spoke to me and said, I had him leave for your protection. And so some of y'all don't know, and this is where he didn't say it, but I just knew in, in, in that moment that, that the protection he was talking about was the influence that my dad would have my, over my life, and I would not be the man I am today. I would not lead from the scars I have today. I would not be the man of God I am today if I would have had his influence in my life. Some of you don't know, my dad is an, Ar is an Arabic Muslim. I'm half Arabic. I don't know none of the culture, none of that at all, because he was not around. But if he had been around... I would probably be a very different man. I would probably be a Muslim, whatever they call them, priests, a rabbi, guru, I don't know what they call them, but I'd probably be something in, in darkness and living in darkness. And so now when I, like, when I, talk, when I talk to my, after that moment of transformation and Jesus just changing my mind and changing the way I think about it, I can look at my dad and have even a relationship with my dad. And I can have grace and mercy from him because I saw the redemptive work of Christ. And I would talk to my brothers and they could not see what I would see because they were just so bitter and so hurt about it. And they couldn't even receive what I was saying. And, and I'm telling you, Jesus can do that for you. God can, he can transform that says, here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, that you can take captive that memory of that pain, of that wound, of that experience, and you can bring that before Jesus and say, change it, God. Change it. Bring this, bring this to the obedient of your word. Bring redemption out of this pain, Jesus, and he will. He will. So realization, transformation. Invite Jesus into that wound and into that memory. And then number three is confrontation. This is where you have to forgive him. You gotta let it go. And I know it's hard. You gotta do the realization and transformation first. You gotta let Jesus into that space and grieve it and allow the wound, him into that space of wound before you're even empowered to be able to confront it and forgive him. I think the common misconception about forgiveness is that it requires you to excuse or dismiss the offender, and it does not. That does not, that's not what forgiveness is. And honestly, dismissal is it's it's not it's not only not forgiveness, it's not healthy. For you to just dismiss it. Because some of you have been doing that and your resentment is causing you to remain stuck. Forever a child. Forever a victim. Forever paused in that moment. See, the longer you hold on to unforgiveness, the longer the pain will control your life. The longer that wound is going to influence you. I love what Nelson Mandela says. He says, when a deep injury has been done to us, we never heal until we forgive. And if you want to get beyond the father wound, I'm telling you, forgiveness is not for them. It's not letting them off the hook. It's letting you off the hook. It sets you free to finally let that person go. And here's how Ephesians puts it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Get rid of that memory. Get rid of that bitterness. It's eating you up. Time is not helping you. Just like Absalom, it's eating you. It's changing you. It really, it, 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 get rid of 
of that bitterness, the rage and the anger that's causing it, the harsh words and the slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, he says, be kind to each other. Be tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. That, that we forgive not because we've been em- enabled in ourselves to do it. No, as I've been forgiven in Christ, I now can release others in Christ. Realization, transformation, confrontation. And then here's the last step. We can actually have restoration. We can get to a place where we are restored, redeemed, and begin to accept God's truth about us. You, you need to receive the words of truth, God's truth over your life. Do you know that you're accepted? You are accepted by God. You are chosen by God. You may not have been chosen and accepted by others, but you are chosen by God. You are accepted by God. You are loved by God. You are God's design, God's creation. You are the apple of his eye. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You are never left or forsaken. You have an eternal inheritance. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ. See, to truly heal from a father wound, you must restore God's narrative about yourself and your worth. You must restore what God says about you. And here's here's the reason, because God wants to be your father. He wants to have an intimate and personal and loving connection with you that that maybe your father messed up and he's human and so are you. Some of you dads are here today and you feel the shame and the guilt because of the wounds that you've inflicted. You're a mom or a parent here today and you feel a little bit of guilt and shame because of the wounds you perpetuated the, and you're still in that place of pain and wound. And the whole purpose of restoration is to get you back to father. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 18 says, and I will be your father, God says, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Romans chapter 8, 15. He says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you feel fearful slaves. You don't have to be afraid of God. He's not mad. He's not angry. He's not critical. He's not going to abuse you or hurt you. Or when you mess up, he's not going to shove you away or say, I'm disappointed in you. What's the matter with you? You're, You are not given that spirit of a fearful slave. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now, we get to call him Abba, Father. That word Abba translated here in our English language today, modern, would be Daddy. We get to, because of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus Christ, that we are adopted and get to call him Daddy, Father. Some of you are here today, and I know I don't know who set you up. God set you up or something like that, but you're here today. You didn't know it was going to be maybe this deep, but you know that there's there's a wound there that still needs to be healed. And even for some of you, you know that there's just a disconnection between you and God. Like you're not as close as you should be, that you need to be. Some of you feel extremely far away from God. You've never really committed your life to Him or surrendered your life to Him. I'd love to pray for you today. Can every head, just, every head bowed in this place and every eye closed, can we just have a moment of prayer? Because there's many of you here today that are living separate from God, like you're away from Him. And today, I want to give you the opportunity to surrender, to finally give up, to finally give in. You've been kind of doing it your way for a long time, and it's time to finally surrender and say, okay, God, I'm done doing it my way. I surrender. I'm going to do it your way. The Bible says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. Some of you need that today. You need that fresh start and that inner healing and transformative work that only God can do to your soul, to your heart, to begin right now today. You may need to make that decision for the first time or you need to make it like again today, but I want to help you with that. I'd love to pray with you right where you're seated. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or anything, but right where you are, I'm just going to count to three and At the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand as a sign of just surrender, a sign of just, that's me. I need Jesus. And I'd love to pray for you right there. Come on, be bold, church. One, two, three. Lift your hand up right now. I need a fresh start. I'm far away from God. Today, I surrender. I surrender. Leave it up for me all over this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over here. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Amen. 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 Over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over here. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen, amen, all over here, keep it up. Yeah, 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 amen, amen, amen. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, God, you're so good. You're so good, God. We need you. Quit put your hands down. Will you say something like this? I'm just going to help you with the words. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I, I realize that I'm messed up, and I need you. I can't do it without you. So today, I finally surrender. I give you my life. I give you my heart, wounds and cracks and all. Today, I declare, Jesus, you are my Lord. Come on, tell him, you are my Lord, my Savior. Surrender my life to you. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. God, I speak over every person in this room today that has a hurt, that has a wound. Every one of us are wounded in some way, affected by our fathers, affected by the father figures in our life. And God, we need your healing. We need your touch. We need you, Jesus. Will you, right just where you are, before you stir and leave, can we have a time just to respond to God's word today? Can I invite you to just stand up right where you are? Come on, will you just stand up with me, and we're just going to posture our heart to worship God? Because after a message like this, I, I would hate, listen to me, church, I would hate for you to leave and for nothing to change. Every single one of us, I believe God is speaking and revealing, has showed you some things inside of you. And what I'd like to do is just spend some time in worship and let the Holy Spirit reveal and do what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do is to usher you to the Son for your forgiveness and let Jesus usher you to your daddy to get your healing. Like right now, I believe breakthrough in this place, healing in this place can happen that you've been dragging around for a long time. At this time, the altars are as well. This place is open. And we would love for you to come during worship and during this time of responding. If you feel like you have a wound, you have a hurt, you have a pain, you have something that you just need to come before God and get out of your seat, do something tangible in this moment, just this is available to you right now. Will you lift your hands, church? Come on. I want you to just be, a, be comfortable in the presence of God and tell him I've carried this for way too long. I'm running to you, Daddy. Come on. I'm not hiding anymore. I'm not acting like it's not there. And I'm not waiting. I'm not hesitating. My heart needs the surgery. God, I come right now broken. I run to you, Daddy. I run to you, Father. Come and heal me, Jesus.
over you today that wherever you are in this room and however old you are today and whatever you're carrying today that God will meet you right here right now God I thank you for a supernatural outpouring of your presence and your healing right now we run to you Father alone Father alone can heal so I thank you for redeeming the pain, the wound, the past, the memory, that we're not bound by it anymore, that today, God, we lay it down. We lay it down. We lay down the pain. We lay down the baggage. We lay down the hurt, and I'm not going to carry it anymore. Today, God, I am changed. Today, God, I am free. Today, God, I let them loose. It's going to be the hardest healing thing right now. Today, God, I let him loose. I forgive him. Because I am where I am today in your presence. I am who I am today. And I can lead from these scars. And I can be a vessel of healing. So I let him go. I release the offense. I release the offender. God, will you restore me? What you say about me, what you think about me, God, will you restore me? That I am forgiven, I am free, I am whole, I am loved, I am worthy, I am enough. Thank you, God, for a miracle today in your house. And I speak over this house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, give God some praise today, church. Come on.